In this video, we'll discuss sequences in metric spaces. As an introduction, let's quickly recap a few basics regarding sequences of real numbers, which we talked about at length in Chapter 1. To determine whether a sequence of real numbers converges or diverges, we plot all of the terms of the sequence on the real line, remove more and more of its initial terms, and observe. If, as we remove more and more initial terms, the rest of the terms squeeze closer and closer to some real number L, we say the sequence converges and call L its limit. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges. Let's look at three examples to see this in action. Consider the sequence n, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. As we remove more and more initial terms, the terms left are larger and larger, so they don't squeeze toward any real number. Thus, this sequence diverges. There are ways to diverge other than getting big, though. For example, consider the sequence negative 1 to the n, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, etc. No matter how many initial terms we remove, we see the same picture forever, the numbers negative 1 and 1. But this doesn't squeeze towards one real number either, so the sequence also diverges. For the sequence 1 over n, 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, etc., as we remove more and more initial terms, the rest of the terms squeeze closer and closer to zero, so this sequence converges and its limit is zero. This last behavior, convergence, is what we're going to focus on. Divergence just means the sequence does anything else. How do we express in a precise logical manner the statement that a sequence xn of real numbers converges to a real number x? The first question is, how close do the terms need to squeeze to the limit x? As close as we like, we paint a target for the terms extending epsilon units to the left and right of the limit x. Epsilon could be any positive number we like, so we say for all epsilon greater than zero. With our target set, we need to toss out enough initial terms so that the rest all stay inside that target. We use capital N as the starting index for the terms that are left, and we say that there must exist some starting index. The hard work's now done. All that remains is to express this diagram in symbols. What we see is that all of the rest of the terms, the terms with index little n, at or past capital N, land inside the target, which means that these terms xn lie strictly between x minus epsilon and x plus epsilon. This definition gives us our model for the definition of convergence of a sequence in any metric space if we phrase it correctly. Let's go to work on that last inequality to turn it into a statement about distances. Subtracting x from all three quantities gives negative epsilon less than xn minus x less than epsilon. Now we can recognize that saying xn minus x is between negative epsilon and epsilon is the same as saying its absolute value is less than epsilon. And finally, we should recognize that absolute value of a difference as our metric on the real line. In a general metric space MD, we simply change this to d of xn and x less than epsilon. This is our definition for convergence of a sequence in any metric space. Let MD be a metric space, and suppose that xn is the sequence in M. We left our introduction with the logical definition of this sequence converging to a point x in M. A quick remark, you might have noticed that I freely interchanged for all n greater than or equal to n, and n greater than or equal to n implies in this definition. It actually makes no logical difference. They're both customary contractions of the more cumbersome formal statement, for all n, n greater than or equal to n implies, but we seldom write it in this way. Conceptually, this works just like our definition for sequences of real numbers did. First, we plot all the terms for our sequence in m. Next, we remove more and more initial terms. And what's left should squeeze closer and closer to x. In terms of the definition, given a positive radius epsilon around x, if we toss out enough initial terms, the rest, for little n greater than or equal to capital N, land inside the target, meaning d of xn and x is less than epsilon. Remember this must work for every epsilon greater than zero, but as long as no matter how small we make epsilon, we can find an n that works, then we have convergence. In this definition, we're always looking at sets of terms, after removing some initial terms. These sets, xn such that little n greater than or equal to capital N, are what we call the tails of a sequence, 
don't let the notation throw you off. These just express the exact sets of points we are looking at symbolically. Here are the sets we're talking about for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Carruthers introduces the term eventually to express what we logically do with these tails of sequences. A sequence eventually has some property p means that there exists some index capital N so that this tail, x sub little n with little n greater than or equal to capital N, has property p. Let's practice using our metric space and sequence concepts to express our definition of convergence of a sequence in a few different ways so that we can see it from as many angles as possible. First, we might recognize that our definition is a statement about distances, which are real numbers. So if we want to think of our new definition for metric spaces in terms of our old one for sequences of real numbers, we can. It means that the sequence d of x and x of distances from the terms to x converges to zero. This is what Carruthers takes as his principal definition. Also, we immediately see that the targets we've sketched are just open balls. d of x and x less than epsilon means that the term xn lives in b epsilon of x. Now, all of these terms xn living in b epsilon of x for little n greater than or equal to capital N is the same as saying that the tail is a subset of b epsilon of x. We can now use Carruthers' term eventually to tighten this up. For all epsilon greater than zero, the sequence xn is eventually contained in b epsilon of x. We can go even further via neighborhoods if we like which hides the number epsilon. For each neighborhood n of x, xn is eventually in n. It's a quick exercise to show that this is an equivalent statement, as all of these open balls about x are neighborhoods of x, and every neighborhood of x contains an open ball of some radius about x. All of these definitions are logically equivalent, so we can pick any one we like. Carruthers favors the first, while I favor the second. Take your pick. Each one looks at convergence from a slightly different perspective using a variety of concepts we've seen, so it's worth understanding all of them. We'll finish up our discussion of convergence with two more terms that have exactly the same meaning as they did for sequences of real numbers. A sequence xn converges if there is some point that it converges to. That is, there exists x in m such that xn converges to x. It diverges if it does not converge. Specifically, for all x and m, xn does not converge to x. Translating our last definition, that of a Cauchy sequence, to metric spaces is even easier. Recall that a sequence of real numbers xn is Cauchy means, for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists n such that m and n greater than or equal to n implies absolute value of xn minus xn is less than epsilon. This is already in perfect shape. All we need to do is change absolute value of xm minus xn which was just measuring the distance between xm and xn, to d of xm xn. Voila! Recall that this means that as we toss out more and more initial terms of the sequence, the rest of the terms cluster closer and closer to one another, without any mention of a limit. This is still the crucial difference between a sequence converging and it just being Cauchy. The fact that we're making a statement about all the possible distances between terms in the tail of our sequence makes it no surprise that we can also express this in terms of diameters. It's a fairly routine exercise to show that this is equivalent to the statement that the sequence of the tail's diameters converges to zero. That's it for sequence concepts. The notions of convergent, divergent, and Cauchy translate fairly directly into the metric space context, which opens them up to a much broader world of mathematics. Some of what we know about these concepts remains true in this context of metric spaces, but not everything. Let's finish up by going through some of the results we have for sequences of real numbers seeing which ones still work and which ones don't in general metric spaces. Some old results that do hold in general metric spaces are, limits are unique. If a sequence xn converges to x, and also converges to x prime, then x equals x prime. All subsequences of a convergent sequence converge to that same limit. Convergent sequences are Cauchy, and Cauchy sequences are bounded. Finally, a Cauchy sequence with a convergent subsequence converges. The proofs of these statements follow exactly the same logic as the corresponding results for sequences of real numbers, but using the metric to make our distance arguments instead. Other results do not hold for general metric spaces, the reason being that the real line possesses certain special properties that not all metric spaces have. And if you look at the old proofs, 
they don't rely solely on arguments about distance. If they had, then they would have worked for all metric spaces. We'll define and discuss those metric space properties later on, but we've already encountered enough metric spaces to point out examples of these phenomena, so you can at least see how they fail in general. In a general metric space, Cauchy sequences don't necessarily converge, even though it really seems like they should because their terms squeeze closer and closer to one another. We can find an example of this phenomenon with our favorite convergence sequence 1 over n. In the real line, this sequence converges to 0 as we saw earlier. But remember that any interval in the real line also serves as its own metric space. In the half open interval 0, 1, for example, the same sequence exists and it's still Cauchy, but it doesn't have a limit. Okay, this does seem a bit like cheating. In fact, having a Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge really does mean that something's missing from your metric space that probably should have been there. The key property at play is metric completeness, which is an important property of the real line. Note that in our fourth good result above, we're supposing the existence of a convergent subsequence. This gives you the limit that you need, which is how the proof can still work. Boundedness isn't what it used to be for sequences either. Bounded sequences need not have convergent subsequences. This relied on the fact that closed balls in the real line are compact. They need not even have Cauchy subsequences. This relied on the fact that closed balls in R are totally bounded. Discrete spaces provide ready examples of this phenomenon. We can take the set of real numbers, but assign to that set the discrete metric instead of our usual one, so that all of its points are one unit apart from one another. We're no longer looking at the real line, but a shattered set of individual real numbers. Our same old friend the sequence 1 over n in this discrete real line is easily seen to be bounded because the distance between any two distinct terms will be exactly 1. But then no matter what subsequence we take of it, and how many initial terms we toss out, the tail of the subsequence will always have diameter 1. Thus no subsequence of this sequence is Cauchy, so none of its subsequences can converge, including the sequence itself, which in this metric space diverges. It looks like we've ended this video with some loose ends to tie up, but we'll discuss these properties of being complete, totally bounded, and compact before we finish our study of metric spaces. In our next video, we'll discuss open and closed sets in metric spaces, of which open and closed intervals in the real line, and open and closed balls in metric spaces, are examples. Till then!